tonight, I think we have, and this is no disrespect, Bobby, I love you to bits, but the, the scoop we have this evening, I think, tops all of our speakers. We've had some really, really great, re really great speakers. Now, I'll tell you a little secret. I created the poster. Brad done it. Where's Brad? Brad. John, it was Brad, it wasn't me. Created the poster, published it on social media, and then sent John the WhatsApp message. <laughs> because John don't do this kind of stuff. Um, honestly, I'm, 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 I'm truly grateful that they've accepted and they've agreed to come and share their journey. They are absolutely inspirational. Absolutely inspirational. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> their business acumen, that's one thing. Just the fact that they've supported poor old Abid for the last eight years. We've held our events here for the past eight years. And I'm sure there's people like Adam States here who was here from day one. We can't get rid of him. But I mean, you know, they've been here from day one. Um, the food, the service, the staff, the atmosphere, the ambience, you know, it's down to the venue, it's down to their service, and it's down to the way they deal with people. So honestly, Bob and John, thank you very much. Give them a round of applause. Now, I asked earlier on on Instagram, what questions should I ask them? And I have loads of questions. So, if I could ask you please kindly to make your way. These are bronze finest. They deserve a bit more than that. Come on, come on. First of all, John and Bob, thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you for having us here, Robert. Thank you. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, Bob we've heard on stage before, um, and Bob speaks really well, and, and I've heard parts of Bob's story over the years. Uh, but I don't think I've ever had the privilege of listening to John on stage. So for me, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a first, um, and it's a great opportunity. So where does the story start from? What happened? How do you go from one chip shop to 18 chip shops? I think... Um Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, before we start this story, I think it's very important that um, our story starts from our mother and her journey and how she struggled in her life to bring us two brothers up. And uh, I think it's important that we talk about her first. A woman who um, came with her husband into this country, 1965. Um, spoke no English. Uh, my father came here as part of the uh, the migrant, um, with the, the influx of people coming in for the to support the locomotive industries, and he was working in uh, a factory, um, Lucas factory on Shaftmore Lane. And that's where he worked with my grandfather and my uncle who used to work there. Um, 1967, uh, she had John. And then I turned up in 1969. And um, two years after, about 1971, 1972, our father left us. And um, our mother was on her own, uh, left to fend for herself. Um, she spoke no English. She had no money. But that didn't stop her. She had to get out of the house in those days. Um, the Kashmiri culture, those, where we're from back home was very much the, the woman stayed home uh, but she had to get out of the house she had to go and find work because she had two mouths to feed and rent to pay so um, she looked for work in um, Stratford Road, Ladypool Road Mosley Road, looked for these lot of textile industries where she worked, she got paid she found work, she got paid some people paid her, some people didn't. It was the way that the industry was. And eventually she found work on Mosley Road, just down the road here, not very far. We drive past it every day when we come here. And we remember the place where our mother uh, started her work life with a company, a little business called John Tucker, uh, an Indian family who took her in, supported her, gave her the love and respect. They know that she was um, a single mother. And she repaid that respect and love as she worked hard. She used to go in seven o'clock in the morning and finish up to 10 o'clock at night, long hours. And then eventually, um, 
as a result of her hard work, the John Tucker gave my mother the keys to the factory that she comes in, in the morning, she lets the staff in and then she closes the factory and lets the people out. So they repaid her that way and, and my mother worked hard. It was a sewing garments for the sports industry, sport, uh, 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 making jackets. She was getting 50 pence a jacket in those days. She worked hard and then eventually um, she was able to uh, bring work home. Her pride was the brother machine that she had in the front front room. If you remember anybody from the brother um, machines? I'm sure many can relate to that. Brrr, 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 every night. Mm. We're trying to sleep and mom 12 o'clock at night, 1 o'clock in the morning. She's making those jackets. She worked hard uh, to bring us two boys up. And then uh, after that she she wanted to help other women in the area. A lot of the women where we lived in Fallows, we just lived in Fallows Road, off the Walford Road here. And um, a lot of women, again, from Kashmiri background, stayed home, they couldn't go out, but they wanted to work, they wanted to earn more money. So my mom just set up a little round. She, she bought work from the factory, bought it home, and distributed that work to the ladies who were, but she built up a network of about 30 women in the area. Um, providing them work. She'd get 50 pence per jacket. She'd give them 30 and keep 20 herself, 20 pence. And all those 20 pences put together over a period of time. She was, uh, she bought her first car. She passed a driving test. She was probably one of the first uh, Kashmiri women to pass her driving test back in 1976. You probably see the white car that she bought. Uh, it was in one of the images here. Datsun 120Y, I remember the number plate CDD189T um, that, and then she had another card after that, UFT 573T, a little yellow 1200 I think it was, but yeah. Um, and then uh, as a result of her hard work, she eventually saved enough money to um, buy the house th that we were living in, um, 18, it was 18,000 pounds roughly like that. But, Oh, it, it was 10,000. 10,000 pound. So all, all those 20 P's just putting together, putting together, putting together, and eventually she was able to buy her own car, her own house, making her independent, independent and also providing a livelihood for all those other women in the area. Uh, and they were able to sustain themselves as well and build their lives. A lot of women will know, uh, I don't know, the, Auntie Najma here knows, uh, knew our mother for what she stood for. She was very supportive. She was, she was also very strong. She kept us, both boys, on the straight and narrow. And um, we owe everything to her. Um, John, at a very young age, 13 years of age, I mean, he's a big lad then, <laughs> but he started working in, um, in my uncle's restaurant. That's, he's working in the kitchens. Adil Tanduri on um, Stony Lane, I don't know. No, I already discovered, I discovered that day that I was working two restaurants away. Yeah. Although I'm six years, seven years younger, I was already working a few, a few doors away. But it's, it's funny how life comes in round circles. Yeah, no, uh, I've, I've been, uh, what was I was saying, you know, but back in them days, obviously I was working with my uncle, started off, uh, you know, washing dishes and just working my way around. Uh, you know, peeling the onions and doing everything because I was always a big lad. Uh, you know, I was 13 years old, but you know, you could easily mistaken me for 17, 18. The only downside was <laughs> when you go pay for your bus fare. You know, you try to pay your <laughs> 11, 12 year old a bus fare, and they say, "Yeah, but mate, take a hike." Uh, that, that was the only downside. And um, then from there, uh, I, I wasn't really good at school. I mean, obviously, Bob's the ac academic in the family, um, so uh, just um, we, you know, uh, had a job in town. You know, always was skiving school to to work as well to help her mother. Um, I was a cleaner at, at one of the warehouses. Probably Andy knows where the Mass House uh, Park is. There used to be an old uh, warehouse called Usha Fashions. <laughs> which I sort of started working there. You know, I went in there for a job, said, how old are you? I'm 16 years old, actually I was 13. <laughs> and uh, so th that's where it was, you know, I was skiving school most days, every day, just working, so we're gonna help him mom, just help him mom uh, with everything else. And 
So um, I think I think mom just decided that, that wasn't the life that she wanted for her children. Yeah. She decided that um, she wanted to sell the property. She wanted to have a business of her own, and um, she sold the house and uh, took us away from this area. She she knew she was, she had good foresight. She knew that this area, that this boy. I mean, we got someone very important here. I think <laughs> Sunny, who's the Sunny, our um, our our our. Audio guy today. Yes, yes. Sonny, uh, I learned something his, that day as well. Yeah, yeah his parents, um, Uncle Paul and his mother, uh, were friends, and then they're the ones who really, you know, helped uh, our mother uh, in 1984. 30, uh, I think it was 31st of May 1984 when we bought the mum bought the first shop. They she helped you sort out the mortgage, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. They really. I mean, you know, credit goes to. Uh, they were they were sort of like our uncle and our auntie. And um, but that's where it all really all started off uh, from from the paper shop. So uh, so you know, before the chip shops, there was a paper shop. In yeah, Erdington. yeah. Mum bought us a small shop in Erdington. Uh, it's still there today. Um, so both brothers, um, you know, the day she bought it, so she sat both of us down and um, said, "Listen, guys, I bought this shop for you, for you two brothers, and um, um, I've done my bit." And uh, this is for you guys. If you make a success of it, you know my blessings are with you. If you mess it up, that's your own misfortune. And I'm going to Pakistan. <laughs> so uh, back then, then both brothers, uh, we worked really hard. I mean, it was a small shop. Um, it was on, it was doing about between 900 pound a week. And um, you know, we on, on Spring Lane, we used to have a family. The East End family used to live on East End back. Uh, back in 1984, and uh, they used to have a cash and carry in in, in Darwin Street, um, where all the brothers they all used to the live together, brothers. and they used to oh, we used to see them, and they used to say, "Look, why don't you come and um, to our cash and carry?" You know, and really success lies uh, our success lies down. Obviously, our mums, duas, and blessings, but you know they really helped us, and they, they they said to us, "Guys, you know, we'll give you unlimited credit." As long as you stick to the terms, and then. How old were you at this stage? Just turned 16. Wow. Yeah, just, wow. Um, just wow. turned 16. Wow. Bob Incredible. was still at uh, Solihull College. I was in school. Only in school. Only in school. Then I, my messed up my CSEs, so I didn't tell mum that. <laughs> in those days, they used to have paper reports, so you can just sort of. I think we've all done a bit of that. You could, you could turn you could turn a, a C into a B. And an a, and a E into a B as well. So mum thought... Mom my had dad's sitting here now, so I can't say anything, no, but I think we've all done... Mum had we've plans for us. Mum was saying that my, my big son's going to be a, a pilot yeah. and the youngest son was going to be a doctor and we thought, that ain't going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> That's not going to happen. So I think I think the older generation all wanted their sons to be pilots. I was meant to be a pilot as well. Yeah. Um, and my dad's sitting there. Um, but, uh, yeah... So, so it's just been uh, in 1984. We we worked really, really hard, both brothers. Um, and from there, we sort of, uh, um, you know, we, we used to have a one on one. Neighbours used to uh, have a have a chip shop in in uh, in Warsaw, and he sort of like decided that he wanna he had enough. And um, then uh, I said to Bob, I said, "Do you fancy uh, a chippy?" So we, both brothers, we went down and had a look. We'd done the deal, and um, that was in 1986 uh, when, when we, we bought the first first fish and chip shop there. So the uh, first one was in Warsaw. Well, the first one was in Warsaw. <coughs> so we had the both shops. I was running the paper shop, so Bob was uh, run, uh, running the chip shop in in, in Warsaw. So um, in Erdington, at Six Ways Erdington, you probably know that was our first big John's in Erdington, and there was a, a, a late night. You've probably seen the snaps on here. Was a, a, play, a shop called uh, Yenton Barbecue, and it was always, always busy, always busy. We used to buy our chips from there all the time. We used to close the paper shop at night and just just go out to drive and look at the, how busy that shop was. And every night we used to go there. And Johnny said to me one day, "Goes Bob, we're going to buy that shop." Yeah. Yeah. It was way. It was out of our reach. It was 135,000 pound to buy that shop in. We're talking 1989. Yeah, 1989. Yeah. Wow. 135,000. 135,000. So I was looking in the newspapers back in them days. Evening Mail. You know, on a Tuesday and a Thursday, they used to have a business for sale section, and always like you know the entrepreneurship. You know, you're always. 
you know, uh, looking at other businesses and always trying to see. Uh, and I, I rang uh, Bob back in them days. It was just the uh, normal phone, you know, you pick up, you dial the number. I said, guess what? I said, this shop's uh, up for sale in Erdington. And um, so we went down and had a look. And uh, it, it was a lot of money, 135000 back in 1989 was a lot of money. But we could, I could see the potential there because that shop opened from five in the evenings until like five the next mo morning. So we all had all the late night trade, all the trade from the nightclubs, all the pubs and everything else. So I thought it's on a busy high street. And then what I'll do is um, take it over. I'll open up for lunch times. And then, you know, that, that will increase the turnover. And um, so trying to convince mom, um, she was a hard woman, as you see, you know, she was, uh, she took no prisoners. She told you, she said, nah, no, it ain't happening. I said, look, mom, it's got to happen. You got to do something. So um, we had a good bank manager at that time and at National West and that West Bank. So uh, both brothers, we went down and um, arranged them my finance, you know, told them a bit of track record of what we'd done with the paper shop and the other chip shop in uh, in Warsaw. I mean, the guy had a lot of faith in us. I mean, back then, you know, you, you'd give them a business plan and, you know, you give them the figures and they and, and if they liked you, they'll, 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 they'll lend you the money. But there was a catch. They says, look, we'll, we'll lend you the money, but you're going to have to put your house up for security, mom's house. So, um, you know, went back, sat down, told mom, took mom, showed her the shop. She, she was all, yeah, all good. Uh, as they all say, yeah, yeah, mom. So did the business plan, wrote it all down and said, right, this is how much it's taking, this is what the margin is, and this is what the profit's going to be. But, you know, even better, I'm going to open during the day. And that will, so, you know, she says, right, that's fine. I said, the bank's done the, uh, the, the finance on it, that we agreed the mortgage, but the catch is you're going to have to put the house up for security. Oops. And... Um, you know, she she was okay at first. Obviously, my stepfather, you know, being a, a, as he was, at first he was okay. We we sit down every evening just after dinner. We would do a, you know the sums up and everything else, and and um, you know keep going through over and over, and trying to convince mom. Mom said, "Yeah, no problem. Yeah, okay, fine, John. How much how much profit we're going to make every week after paying?" Every, I said, "Mom, we're going to be left with five hundred pound profit after mortgage payments, everything else." She said, "Right, I'm going to keep the five hundred pound. Anything over and up above the money you're going to make, we'll still go fifty fifty." I says, "Fine." I says, "I'd do anything <laughs> to just to get this shop. I'd do anything." So this went on for quite some time, you know, we'd have meetings in the evening, but the Greek guy who owned the shop was just getting paranoid impatient, and then yeah. impatient. He says, are you buying this shop or you're not buying it? Are you buying it or you're not buying it? I said, look, oh, I'm sorting it out, sorting it out. But it just went on for a couple of weeks, you know, at night, mom said, yes, no problem. I'll you know, take me to the solicitors, take me to the bank, I'll yeah. sign the house over. In the morning, she was change, she, of, mind. change of mind. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's been up for a couple of couple of weeks, and the deadline came because the bank facility was going to expire. Uh, the Greek who owned the shop just really had enough. He just thought, you know what, these guys are messing around, and um, so we, we we sort of like uh, you know one evening we were all sat down for dinner, and um, you know sat down and I said, look, mum, tomorrow's the last day. And um, it's, it's dragged on for quite some time, and you keep promising me, and then in the morning you change your mind, only to find out that my, my, my stepfather kept, you know, during the night telling, oh, no, no, these boys are going to gonna mess it all up, you're going to yeah. lose the house, and, and, and everything else. So um, just carried on during dinner, finished dinner, I said, look, Mom, what's going to happen? She turned around and said, right, sorry, sorry, son, it's not happening. I said, Mom... All these months, weeks, you've been telling me, yes, yes, and then, you know, we've been trying to negotiate. I said, right, I'm leaving home. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. He did so, as well. He left home. So, usually, you know, everybody, you know, leave home because they can't marry their partners or anybody else. For me, I couldn't get the job, so... 
I quickly got up and I darted out uh, out of the front door. My mum chased me, but she couldn't catch me. So we had a little Morris Marina back in them days. So I started the car and then just drove around and... and you were going to come back home that night, weren't no, you? I didn't come back home that, that night. And then in the morning, obviously, she had to get up to open the paper shop because she knew I hadn't come home. So they, they opened the shop in the morning and they called Bob and said, look, go find him. <laughs> so uh, He's only sleeping two doors up the road. <laughs> <laughs> I hit the van. and <laughs> So uh, Bob uh, come around and said, look, mum's agreed. So uh, we, we sort of, uh, mum agreed, and that, that was really the start of the journey at that Six Ways Erdington. Yeah, the, Erding, the Erdington shop put us on the map. That yeah. was where we actually started. We had, we, the Warsaw shop was just experience in the food business to get in there. You know, we learned a lot of lessons from there, you know, and uh, painful lessons as well. But that's where we actually got our experience. <laughs> then the big jump was the uh, Erdington Six Ways. Owning, owning one chip shop is hard enough. Yeah, um, I, I think what what actually happened is is when when we refurbished the store and back in them days, th th this industry was predominantly dominated by the Greeks. Greeks. So the Greeks had uh, you know they had the monopoly for all the chip shops. So myself and Bob we just just got into it and we said right we've just refurbished this store. So right how shall we piss the Greeks off? So back in them days, the fish and chips used to be two pound uh, back in 1989-90. And um, there used to be a big size of piece of fish, about eight, between seven and a half, eight ounce piece of fish and, and pile of chips. And um, really, if you, if you eat that meal, it, it'd be nice, but the thing is, it'll, just, it'll, it'll be just too much. So we said, right, we're going to piss these Greeks off and we're going to start off with the opening offer of 99 pence. There's a, there's a picture on the slides where you've got yeah. the 99. Yeah, so what we did is I, we, we, we cut the portions in half. So instead of serving an 8-ounce fillet, we, we did a 3.5, 4-ounce fillet and a cone of chips. And, and the reality is, is that the, the quality, the, the secret behind good, good fish and chips is the freshness of the product. As soon as it comes out of the pan, that's the best time to eat fish and chips. And, and that, that's where they all started off, 99 pence. So as soon as we opened the first door, you know, the, the queues were out. We used to open at 12 o'clock. And I said to them, by the time we opened at 12 o'clock, there was always a 20 deep queue waiting outside. Wow. And then... Um, uh, and this was in so that, 89. So that did piss the Greeks off. The, yeah. the queues pissed the Greek off. Mission accomplished. Yeah, yeah. Was that in, 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 in 89? 89. 89. 89. 89. 89. 89. And, and then, uh, you know, then we, we started opening half an hour early. The queues were still out there. Ten, uh, you know, then another half an hour early. So trying to catch up. Because the thing was, we couldn't, put, cook, uh, we couldn't uh, cook the product fast enough to serve. So there was always constantly cooking. And we all, when we reopened, the, uh, when we refurbished the store, the actual the, the deal was that we'd only do a, a month's promotion and, and just really piss everybody off around in, in, in the Erdington St. Caulfield area. Because there was a, a very popular George's Fish Bar on the High Street, Erdington, very predominantly, very, very busy back in them days. You had a great reputation. And, and, and that's where it really all, all, all started off. The 99p was a lost leader, but we, when people would come in, they'd buy this, they'd buy that to, to build. By that time, then all of a sudden, the first week, you know, I'd get up on the phone and say, listen to the, uh, the potato guys and potato merchants. I said, could you bring a ton, ton of spuds quick? I need them quick because we, we were that busy. And within the first few weeks, the industry found out that these guys are turning the numbers over. So why not? So everybody was ringing me up. So one supplier ringed me up. Oh, I got cod at, at 11 pound a stone. I get another guy ringing me up at 10 pound a stone. So I said, myself and Bob, we sat down, worked out the margin, and said, look, profitability is there. Let's, let's, uh, let's screw all the wholesalers. So what it was doing, we were just playing one against the other. Yeah. So we're trying to maintain our margins. Yeah. We, we, were, we were haggling with our, with our wholesalers. And on the back of that, before people started working out what we were really doing, um, you know, we built the brand. Absolutely. Uh, so... One chip shop is hard enough, and I do insurance. I insure a lot of chip shops up and down the country, um, and the poor owners. I mean, you know, they they add their depth. How on earth do you go from one 
and start opening multiple stores and then managing them as well? Um, it, it's, it's, it is hard work, but it, it was all down to, to, to the team. Um, you know, even up until today, the guys who helped us uh, who have started, they were all, we were all young, you know, 16, 17 year old, and them guys are still with us today, up until this day. And it was all about teamwork, and it was all about, you know, working hard. It was all about, our vision was to have multiple, multiple stores, you know, and then you just build the team around and that. Then, and, and then you, 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 you opened the first halal drive through chip shop. Yeah, that was in Cook's Lane. Uh, Cook, in uh, Charmsy Wood. Yeah, Charmsy Wood. What year was that? That was 2000? 2002. And where does the inspiration for that come from? Well, the halal, you see, 20 years ago, 21 years ago, the halal food market was very underserved. Absolutely. You know, you probably had to go to Lady Pearl Road. It was the only place. The Hawke Babas, and that was Lohoka it. Hawke Babas was about it. And uh, we saw a market. We knew that at the time that, you know, this market's going to grow. And even to this day now, in 2023, the market is still underserved. There's a lot of uh, halal restaurants and takers that have opened are still not enough. And we we just jumped on that 21, uh, 21, 2002, opened the first. Bit of a gamble though, wasn't it? Yeah, it was such a, a huge commitment, yeah, such huge a huge gamble. site. Especially in Shams Lewood, because there's no packies there. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> no, it's I mean it's a huge, well, it's, it's a huge gamble. Serving all the English it? people halal food, <laughs> 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 I'm telling them they're going straight to paradise after this. <laughs> So, I mean, I, I was at Birmingham Uni when you opened up um, uh, Selly Oak. Yeah. And you're quite right, because there was no halal food in Selly Oak. Yeah. Um, we were stuck with restaurants like the Chuman, which we never ate from. Um, um, and I can't go into that in the public domain. Um, but, um, you know, when, 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 when Big John and Selly Oak opened up, for us, it was a, it was a, it was a godsend. Um, and the food was just brilliant. It, it just, and it's still until today. I'm not saying that because you're sitting next to me. But genuinely, the food has just got better and better. But yeah, it, I mean, there was a niche there. There was a need for it. And strategically, how did you plot or plan your locations? Because Selly Oak was a no-go area for Asians, particularly where you are by Sainsbury's. Heading up towards Northfield, you, we had to wear body armor. <laughs> if, if we were people of color, and, and this is no word of a lie, I was, I, I was doing taxi in 95, 96, 97 in Selly Oak, Willie Castle, Bartley Green. It, it wasn't the nicest of areas. So what inspired you? First of all, Chalmsy Wood. And then you pick them and you went Selly Oak, which, I mean, Selly Oak is a nice area, but, this, but, but you're towards the further end of Selly Oak, towards Northfield. Well, there's a funny story with, with, with Selly Oak. Selly Oak came across when uh, my nephew, my little nephew, Mohit, he's about four years old, we're sitting at home. Next, sitting next to uh, uh, the the cooker, his mom had put some uh, water in a pan, and he was kicking the kicking his legs, kicking his legs forward, and then suddenly he kicked the pan of full water. He fell down, and the hot water fell on the back of him, burnt him. So we rushed him to hospital, and en route to hosp Selyuk hospital. Selyuk yeah, hospital. Selyuk yeah, yeah. hospital. They had a special and, and, burns and, unit. And en route, as we parked the lights there, on the corner, as we were dropping my sort of shop on the corner. <laughs> I thought, forget this. <laughs> you, 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 I think his, his, his mother. That's can, a true entrepreneur, right there. His, isn't his, it? his mother can deal with this. Let me just take this number down. <laughs> so, we um, got the number from. I got the number. The next morning, I ring John because John had some contacts in the um, the estate agents, and I said, look, we got to get this shop. It's in a brilliant location, uh, ideal uh, for Big John's, and uh, within within a few. It used to be an Uncle Sam's Pizza at the time. Yeah. Just closed down and. We managed to secure it within a few weeks, and uh, that's the first. So how many chip shops in the West Midlands now is there? <coughs> there are about 20. 20. And you got, you're, you're, you're as far as Leicester, aren't you, as well? So from chip shops, then the transition into restaurants. I mean, um, uh, restaurants, I mean, obviously, um, when I worked at the other restaurant, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure you, 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 you used let's to... Let's not, let's not talk about that, please. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, so just just to say, back back in those days, the 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 restaurant industry in in Spark Hill was predominantly Balti um, houses, wasn't it? It was it was Balti houses, um, and there was no Asians as customers. It was um, um, white people, um, and we used to spend time just smashing each other's windows, <laughs> in spite 
And this was the restaurant trade back in, way back in the late ni um, early uh, early nineties. So there's a chance we met <laughs> many years ago. I can't recall, but there is a possibility. <laughs> yeah. So uh, obviously, background was uh, you know I've been in the rest. Was started off in the restaurants. You know, been through all the rigmarole, the peeling the onions, making the dough, and then helping the main chef um, at that time. And, and, and learning through all the way through and then working in the front and then until mum bought us the shop. So we always had aspirations, you know, to, to have a restaurant. And it was Bob uh, went down back in them days. Was it Star City? Sure, yeah, sure, when, I, when I used to have my fit body, I used to go to uh, Holmes Place on Star City. Yeah. And this particular place next to Holmes Place was called Fatty Arbuckles. They just closed. It's, it's amazing. Every time I go across the building, it closes down. <laughs> so... So I was, I was going to the gym in Holmes Place and I walked past this and I could see people moving stuff out. Fatty Arbuckles was closing down and uh, again I rang John up. So basically John. you go around spotting places and John yeah. makes it happen. It. Yeah, yeah, John definitely makes it happen. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, so so Sheikh Khan in, uh, in Star City was yeah, the first yeah. one. Yeah, that opened in 2005. And then came Oodle Noodles? Uh, Oodles Noodles came in 2008. <coughs> um, um, and I'm... Um, that's got nothing to do with Asian food. What's, what's, no, no, the, what's the inspiration? Pan, that's, that's a pan-Asian. Um, well, what it was is that um, Sheikh Khan, when we opened that in 2005, it was very successful and really um, people enjoyed the cuisine. And at that time, there used to be um, a bar uh, called All Bar One um, at, uh, in there. And we, I found out in the industry that one of the major players going to come and open a, 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 a like an Indian restaurant there, so um, I thought, well, you know, if another Indian restaurant comes in, that that's going to sort of like take the lion's share of the business. So I worked out that uh, that the rent was uh, two thousand pound a week, but if someone else comes in and takes another twenty, thirty percent, we'll end up losing a lot more. So uh, that that's where it came, and um, um, we, we was. Uh, um, there was a, there was a concept called uh, the Noodle House um, in Dubai. I don't know whether you guys have been to Dubai. There's a there, there's a chain called the Noodle House. So I contacted them and um, said, so look, you know, w would you be interested in in in, in doing a, a, a like and give me a master franchise for for a, a Pan Asian concept? So that, that's where it really all started off from. Uh, but uh, we, we were about to sign up, and then on the eleventh hour. They sort of like let me down and said, right, we're not, we're not coming into the UK market. So we had this lease on our hands, and that's where we uh, we, you we, took we, it on yourself. We, we took it on ourselves. We we got chefs in, and and then that's where Oodles and Oodles began. Fantastic. And then you've got Tipus. Yeah, Tipus. Like, I yeah. mean, this was 2013. 2013. So this opened in 2013. It's ten, uh, ten years in September. It's ten years. Ten years, and and ten years ago, I mean, it was different compared to all the rest and even today I think it still holds that prestige where it's, it's yeah. unique in terms of decor in terms of food um, but how do you create something like this 10 years ago in your mind and then execute it um, obviously um, there's, 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 there's a niche in the market for especially for you know the Asian families you know if, if you see the footfall downstairs in, in, in all our restaurants Nearly uh, 85, 90 percent is all Asian, and and 10 percent is non-Asian. Uh, out of which, you know, we would say 80 percent are female, uh, and then the rest, uh, the other 20 percent. So there was a, there was a need as as Asians were were going out, entertaining. Uh, they wanted to go to halal places, and and that that's where it all started off from. I mean, from from Star City, Sheikh Khan's. And then, and then there became uh, uh, Tipu Sultan. John, to be honest, John actually loves the restaurant business. He he, he creates some amazing dining experiences. Um, you've probably seen it here when we opened Sheer Khan. Sheer Khan is going. will be going through a, a major refurbishment next year. Uh, we've opened another one in London, Feltham. Sheer Khan, ama amazing looking restaurant. So, yes. John's just got that vision and the and the eye for detail of how he wants the restaurant doesn't matter what you say and i say look you know if john wants it that way that's the way it's got to look and and, 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 and he delivers and he delivers 
I, I talk about attention to detail. Your branding across all of your businesses is, is, is pretty unique. The Big Johns, and, and I said in one of my videos, like our last keynote speaker was, um, was um, from um, Poundland, and surveys said that 83% of the population have been through a Poundland. I would reckon more than that in Birmingham have been through a Big John's at some point. Yeah, well, by Is anybody means, in here who hasn't been in a Big John's? The girl from, uh, the girl from Swansea. <laughs> <laughs> she's here somewhere. I think. Oh, there yeah. she is. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Big John's. I mean, we've, we've seen, uh, I mean, uh, I've seen two generations through Big John's doors, three generations, you know, you, uh, our sort of generation, and then the, then the next generation, the parents we see. So you know, we've, 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 uh, it's, it's been a brand, and I've seen the, the, the kids grow up, and they've married, and seen their kids coming in as well. Wow. We've been we've been blessed with some uh, good designers. Uh, we met a guy called Aidan Keane, who met us uh, 15 years ago, and he told us where this business needs to go. He, that man had vision about the food industry, and he was part of the rebrand program. All this Big John's rebrands that you're seeing now is part of his vision. He's pa he passed away about five years ago, but an amazing guy, amazing guy. Uh, and he's, in, he's involved in a lot of the, the bars and, and, and uh, restaurants and in the city now, his, his, his company uh, still goes on and they're part of the design of, and, and the landscape of Birmingham at the moment. So building such a big empire and, and such a vast empire, you've, there's, there's gotta be knockbacks. Now you explained the knockback with your mom initially and how you dealt with that. Um, how do you generally deal with knockbacks? Because as business owners, I'm sure all of us in this room, we have setbacks and knockbacks all the time. Um, and sometimes they can be detrimental and, and just make us lose hope. You yeah. obviously haven't lost hope. You've yeah. carried on. No, uh, I, I think it's all about the vision. You know, you, you, you have your goals and your ambitions and your, your vision. Um, you know, you've got to keep going. You know, you get knockbacks, you get setbacks. You have challenges, you know, everybody has challenges. We have challenges, we have challenges every day. But you've got to keep focused, you've got to keep growing, you've got to keep leading from the front. You know, and you're only as good as the team, you know, us both brothers, you know, we, we, we're running at 100 miles an hour, but you, you need the team to be running at 105 miles an hour. So it's all about the people, it's all about, um, you know, the, 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 the team. You know, it's, it's very, it's, uh, you know, our success goes down, obviously, you know, uh, our mother's blessings and prayers, um, but, you know, the team around us who, who, who've made this all possible, you know, the credit goes, you know, the, the working, I mean, my, both brothers, you know, we, we've worked very, very hard, you know, worked seven days a week, 15, 16 hours a day, and, and it's all down to the team, you know, and, and it's all about planning, working hard, and keeping focused. You've both mentioned the word brothers quite a few times, and, and, and you, your whole journey so far has been about you both collectively do things, and I think it's very admirable the way it's happened. But is there differences of opinion? And if there is, what happens then? Yeah. Who wins? You, you don't say no to John, I'll tell you that now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, look, the, um, talking about setbacks, the biggest setback we've had in our life is in uh, 2008 when our, when our mother passed away. Um, it was a big shock for us because, you know, if someone's going through an illness, you know, inevitably they're going to pass away, and you know. But our mother, she was with us the night before, talking, laughing, joking, and the next morning she was gone. Um, it took us about <clears throat> four years, possibly five. We were grieving till then. We stopped. I think between 2008 and 2013, apart from this restaurant, we opened no Big John's. We just our heart and mind wasn't in it. But it takes someone who lifts you up and says, guys, come on, we've got, to, we've got to carry on. And that was John here. He's not just the brother of my brother, but he's the father of the family. And he took it upon himself to lift us all up, the family, the children, the, to... <laughs> and it's, it, it, is, it is difficult, you know, when... Um, I mean, we, we, we think of her every day. Not a day goes by that you know we don't think of it's her, a loss. and um, you know we miss her immensely. We miss that you know every time we we used to open a shop, she used to be in Pakistan, and um, we used to say, "Mom, we're opening a shop. You've got to come in. You've got to. We won't, we won't do the opening without her." She goes, "I'm only con coming over under one condition." 
that the first day's takings are mine. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you take ten pound, hundred pound, thousand pound. I am keeping the first night's takings, and I used to say, "Oh my God, you know that's the profit gone down the pan for the whole week." <laughs> but, but she she took that money, and and what she used to do was take that money back to her Pakistan, and she used to go and support the poor, <coughs> feed the poor, clothe the poor, which then led on to your Anzal Bay Foundation. Yes, uh, provide provide uh, dowry, provide uh, support for uh, families who couldn't get their daughters married. She used to do those marriages. She was doing all sorts of work in Pakistan with that money. So um, we're so grateful for what she's done for us. Fantastic. So I've been to your office a few times and I've enjoyed a cup of tea there. And me and Bob are always chilling and having a biscuit. And But you're always working. Can't get a word in sideways because you are so focused. Yeah, what that, is that, the motivation? Um, and how do you do it? Because I look at you sometimes, I think, what's he doing? Yeah, just, uh, I, I'm full of life, full of energy. You know, even the boys, you know, my nephews, you know, we just come back from China. Uh, we, we went on a, on, a, on a buying trip and um, I'd, I'd wake them up in the morning, come on boys, what's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, what is your motivation? What's, the, what, what's your reason to wake up every day and do what you do? Um, it's, it's 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 just the drive, you know, satisfaction, you know, it's it's uh, it's, uh, it's the drive, the, the the vision, you know. To, we obviously we worked hard creating a brand, and then you know it just keeps you motivated, you know, you're just full of life. It gets me to roll out of bed every morning and you know face the day with full of challenges. It's not it's not money. If you if that's no, it's not money. No, no. no. Not I, money. I mean, if it was money, it's clearly not money. No, it's clearly not, not money. money. If it was money, we would have been happy. Probably 10, 15 years ago, two or three shops we're happy it was making yeah, yeah. enough money for our families or for ourselves. Yeah, it's yeah, not. Yeah. It's not money. It's. Uh, I think. Um, it's more of a legacy now. So. It's legacy. Uh, motivation uh, comes from, you know, seeing the brand growing. Our, our intentions are that we want to take this brand national uh, and international as well. Uh, the Big John's brand, and next year we're looking to launch another franchise, a, a home de pizza home delivery. Uh, franchise which will support people who can't really afford the big numbers and get a, a, a smaller franchise uh, for them uh, to support them to get them into business and then obviously John's got this big project on uh, which is huge which is massive congratulations on that it's an absolutely huge project I was with him I was with him was it yesterday or this morning this morning I was walking behind him this morning and I was thinking what he's got himself <laughs> into man what's he doing here because it's just such a a big project, a thousand. So that's going to be the largest buffet in the UK, or yeah, it's like going to be 800 seater buffet, uh, 200 seater a la carte, and then we got a thousand seater uh, banqueting facility. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> so, um, so it's the next Chutney Chat. I was going to say our next year's event at Chutney and Chat will be held at that venue. I'm booking it now. Um, but uh, wow, amazing. So your charity work, I mean, you're also, you're doing the Mela and you're giving a lot back to the community. I mean, there's many business people that you've supported, help start them up, um, introduce them to suppliers. Um, but your, 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 your Mela, I think, is, is absolutely huge, giving something back to the city, giving something back to Birmingham. Um, 80,000, 80, 90,000 people at it. Attending yeah, about seventy to eighty thousand a year. Yeah, yeah, every day, every every year we do it. Why would you do that for? Because we're nutters. We surprise ourselves sometimes. <laughs> Why would anybody take on the headache of running the Birmingham Miller? I mean, it's eighty thousand people over a weekend. The logistics, the nightmare, the the the, the 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 dealing with the people, the stall holders, the health and safety, the artists, the weather, British weather. Um, why? When you've got all this going on? Well, we, we, we took on the Mela in 2015 when uh, local authorities were moving funding away from li religious events. They clearly said that there's no more funding in the pot. So in 2015, we were invited to be the sponsors of the event. So we just went on to the, to the event on the day and had a look. And I, when I saw it, I thought, you know, this event should stay on as a free community event and it can grow. I mean, in those days, when the council had it, they were have, they were attracting numbers about 10,000 every year. Yeah. And like last year, when, well, earlier on this year, in August, when we done, we had 70,000 people. Turn. Wow. We, wow. Wow. Yeah. 
And it's not, it's not just 70,000 people. It's the artists that come and the logistics and the looking after and, and the whole thing. And, and the Mela is actually a great experience. It's an it's a, it's a international event now. I mean, you go to Pakistan and people are talking about it in Pakistan. Um, and it's well, uh, everybody wants, looks forward to it every year. Uh, we put on, we make no money out of it. I've got no hair left because of this Mela. <laughs> And you know it's, uh, but we do it for the for the community. We, we enjoy doing it, and um, it takes about three months of our life out. But you know, when it comes together, we really enjoy it. I think as citizens of Birmingham, we need to say thank you for that because it, it really is um, exceptional. And then we go on to your charity work and the Anzul Beg Foundation in um, in honour of your mother and the work that you're doing nationally and internationally. Um, what kind of stuff? Well, I'll take this opportunity to do a plug. There's some items outside from the Anzal Begum Foundation. All those items that we sell, whatever money we get from that, we send it back to Pakistani supports those families who have created those items. We're working particularly in Tharparkar in Sindh, uh, where poverty levels are, you know, unimaginable. Um, I was... The, the, the foundation, just to go back about, the foundation was set up in our late mother's name after she passed away, and uh, and it was to carry on the work that I mentioned earlier that she was doing in Pakistan, feeding the poor, clothing the poor, um, and you know doing all all sorts of amazing work. And we thought, and this a lot of this work that she was doing came to light after she passed away. People approached to say, you know, your mum done this for us. These daughters are married because of her. These this house is running because of her. This this building was derelict. She built the house for some for family. So we said, well, we're just going to continue that work, and then. 2019, I really gave it a push. I'm blessed to have my brother Zahir here somewhere. Zahir from Human Appeal, who took me to uh, Pakistan. He said, look, come and visit us. Come with us. Come with our charity. Have a look at the work we're doing. There's an amazing project coming um, where we can provide water to people who have not seen water for generations in Tharparkar. Um, wow. And we <coughs> started with the one, uh, one village, and now we're on 60. 60, and how many people is it supporting now? Over, over 100,000 people. Wow. And it's, um, we've done some jointly with the, with the Human Appeal and uh, the work they're doing, in, in, and they're our delivery partners. I mean, we don't have any, uh, any sort of people on the ground there. They've got the team there who carry out the, we raise the funds, we collect the funds from good, generous, generous people like yourselves, and then, <coughs> We go out with them, and the the thing with the Unzel Bacon Foundation is we don't just pass the money on to delivery partners. We go there and stand by them, make sure that that money is reaching uh, the goal and achieving the goal that we want to achieve. And and they've delivered uh, these 60 villages. Fantastic, amazing work. So John, as an entrepreneur, and I'm sure as many of us today, after hearing your story, we aspire to you because I think there's a lot of people in the audience. So when I announced John and Bob, but a few people did approach me and said, John and Bob, what are they gonna talk about? <laughs> and my response was that, well, people come from China to come and touch the bull ring. And we live here and we don't really care about it. So there is people out there who need to know John's and Bob's story. And it is, it is really, really inspirational. And when I shat, uh, sat with Bob a couple of weeks back and, and, and I went through the, this whole journey, I thought, wow, incredible. So um, hopefully we've delivered something to the uh, audience today. Now I open up to the community. Sorry, before that, any words of wisdom to the business community, John? Because you are an entrepreneur through and through. From you know having vendettas against your competitors to arguing with your mom to um, negotiating with your suppliers. And I think as business owners, we all do these things. And if we don't, we're not entrepreneurs. We're not business people because at some part of our business, we've all done these sort of things, maybe in different ways, but we do go through these phases. Um, but only very few get to the point that the brothers have got to. And may the Almighty give them more. But any words of wisdom from yourself? I mean, look, it's, it's, it's not really easy. I mean, it's, uh, everything is hard work, but the thing is you've got to keep focused uh, and believe in yourself. Um, you know, it's good to take advice off everybody, um, but trust your instincts, you know, your gut feel. Um, you know, a message that mum always said to us, she says, look, if you feel right inside you, 
you know, trust yourself because you're the best judge of character yourself. And, and nothing's really easy these days. So you just got to work hard, keep focused, have a vision where you want to take your business. And really, really importantly, invest in the team that's going to help you in that journey. Because um, what, what, what I believe in, you know, if whilst the brands and businesses are growing, you have to bring in a lot more people who are far more experienced than yourself that can help you to get to that elevate. Uh, you know, Do you I'm, feel I'm, people maybe sometimes fear that, bringing in people that are better than them because they feel that they may I mean, lose control of their business? Uh, I mean, it's a lot of with the, with the Asian businesses, you know, we, we like to keep control. You know, we, sometimes, you know, we, we do it ourselves, you know. You know, you, can you trust this guy? But you know, you, as long as you put systems in place to, to keep the protect the business, and then and, and it's just no, nothing's easy. You know, we all look over the fence and think the grass is greener. You know, look at your business. I think the grass is greener, but I will tell you what, it's harder to cut. But um, you know, just 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 you know, keep focused, keep you know driving for. You know, you're going to have challenges, and and you're just going to keep focused and then and, and just believe in yourself. And then, you know, you can achieve anything. Fantastic. And Bob? Mine probably would be to say that, you know, don't judge success by the watches you got on, the cars that you're driving, the houses you live in. Those are just the, the fruits of your labor. You judge success. Your success comes from how you change the life of other people, either through charity. Absolutely. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. Brilliant. You know, the, the, the Almighty has blessed us Everybody in this room, you're blessed, you're affluent. But Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests you with that wealth. He tests you with your children. He tests you with what he gives you. What do you do? Do you hoard your wealth and look at your bank balance every day and say, wow, I've got a million pound in my account or whatever it is? Or do you use that money to make lives of other people better? And that's very, very important. Fantastic. Yeah, because we're just, we're just caretakers in life. You know, this is not really ours. You know, this will be passed down generations. And we'll all be forgotten. I know? think what's surprisingly apparent in both of yourselves is your humbleness yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 and how humble you are.